What is up, everybody? It's me, Duke Farley, back at it again here on Lost at Sea. And tonight I am joined, unfortunately, by the third placer of Ascendance Live Season 2, Jodalee. What is up? It's good to speak to you again. It seems like the only time we speak is during exit interviews. I know. I'm I'm honestly, this is Ascendance is my white whale. I'm never gonna get into the secret, super elusive winners chat. That's so disappointing. Joden Rosenberg must think I'm such a loser. <laughs> I joke, I joke. How are you? How have you been? Oh, I've been well. You know. It's been uh, kind of a, I've been able to gather my friends every Thursday to come and watch me gallivant and spiral in ascendance. And now having my Thursdays free, I don't even know what I'm going to do next Thursday because I still get Thursdays off. So I think I'm just going to sit around and be in my room and not know what to do with myself now that the season's over. Oh, we can't come soon enough, honestly. <laughs> Sad. Um, but maybe you could rewatch the uh, season or any of my YouTube videos. You know what? I hear that there is a lovely channel called Lost at Sea that I can very much get into. I think everyone else should too. <laughs> so subscribe to that. Um, Jodalee, I'm excited to talk to you about your journey here in Ascendance Live Season 2. Um, oh. Obviously have played a couple versions online and now you brought your talents into the live format. Was this your first couple questions? Was this the first time you played a live game? And second off, was this the first time you unmasked yourself? Um, okay. Organized live game. Yes. In um, grades, like eight my spanish teacher hosted a version of survivor across the semesters and if you won you got an automatic a on the final and i won on my fourth try because i took two years so if you count that as a live game no this is not but like as an official like go to a hidden location and compete yes this was my very first live game and was it the first time i unmasked myself technically not many moons ago i competed in an org where I made it to the final two when I was uh, a lot less polished, I would like to say, than I am now. Uh, it was uh, 1984 and I unmasked myself because I knew that was gonna be the key to winning all the jury votes. And then I handedly lost. So <laughs> I was like, okay, we don't need to necessarily do that anymore. But since then I've never competed in any sort of like game, like unmasked, like ever. It, 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 uh, it's just never happened for me so to that end yes this was the first time I had unmasked and went to go rub knuckles with people you know <laughs> so you had played um a couple orgs with some of the contestants so they knew the voice and I was wondering was it shocking to people where you showed up and then you started talking and they're like oh wait is that totally I okay I remember so when I rounded the corner, obviously, like, I knew some of the people, but I just remember rounding the corner that first day and looking around, like, standing at the top of the stairs and being like, oh, my God, I only recognize Keaton. Everyone else is a complete stranger to me, which obviously wasn't the case. But then I sat down and I started looking at people. And that's when I got to have my moment of, like, oh my gosh, there's so many like Olympians of the org community that like, A, I've either played with or seen or met before or people that I had never met, but I've heard the rumors of. And I remember I was very nervous. So I just told myself, just look straight forward. And when you introduce yourself, obviously people are, some people are gonna know your name. So when you have that moment of like saying your name, make eye contact with the one person you really wanna work with so that you can like see their reaction and they'll see you and it will be cosmic energy and it'll be delightful. So when I started speaking and I said, hello, my name is Jodely, I made sure to lock eyes with Melissa and I could like see Melissa's face be like, oh, and I had the corner of my eye, I saw Erica's and I was like, oh, just keep talking, don't react, <laughs> pretend you don't know anyone. Cause when I, I had a shuttle buddy when I got there, which was Paul. So we knew we, that we would like were, sequestered together and Paul had not a clue who I was he didn't know me from a hole in the wall and so I was like okay just like 
be like that. You, you are one in the fold. Just because this is a big reveal for you does not mean these people won't slash you across the throat if they need to. So <laughs> I was just trying to keep it calm. And sorry, to answer your question, were people shocked? I think people were, but I was only locked on Melissa. I don't know who else recognized me. <laughs> so the game starts out and, um, you know, casino night happens and then the, the blind pick. Um, but I want to ask you a question about some of your um, intro videos and basically a theme throughout the season, um, which was a little rivalry between yourself and Drew Olson. Um, at really? one point you mentioned him being a demon. So I want to <laughs> ask you, kind of give me the backstory of your relationship with Drew coming into the season and then the evolution that it took throughout this season. Okay, so Drew and I both uh, originally met years ago on a lovely little site called Tengage, which I know is like, oh, a lot of people don't like that site, but it's what started me in the org world, so I will always love it. That's where Drew and I met. And we fell out of contact, contact, and I never saw him for years until um, Ghosts of the Past, which happened after season nine. And it was a week long mini where the m people who were most deserving of a second chance or a third could come back and compete for a week and have a lovely time. Drew and I were both competing in there. And I remember being like, oh my goodness, because I watch every season of Ascendance, I'm a super fan. And watching season nine, seeing him get rocked out and seeing him be like, everyone was like, oh, Drew was the most robbed. Drew totally could have won. Drew was amazing. To then competing against him, I remember sending a confessional within like 10 minutes of meeting him and being like, oh, because he was voted most likely to win in his touchy subjects. And after meeting him, I was like, I feel like the strategic gameplay like oozing off of him. How dreadful. So I was like, okay, we're going we're gonna to have to be wary of this one. The game actually starts and... Long story short, a lot of people do not want to work with me in Ghosts of the Past, and it's very hard to gain any traction on anything. But there's like a pivotal round where we get to eliminate Roy Patricks, and the unlikely trio of two people I personally did not want to work with ended up becoming a very powerful three, which is me, Drew, and JG Kars. And all of my allies are falling to the wayside, but I'm still here and all of a sudden I have like a path forward by joining up with these evil forces and so I'm like okay wonderful and we get to the top three together and in my mind even now I'm like it makes complete total sense for both Drew and JG to cut each other and to take me to the end and I have so many votes in the jury that like are locked that they don't even know about that I deserve to win the season. Like I saw it very clearly. And I just remember throughout the season, Drew being like, oh my gosh, we've known each other for years. Oh, I live for you. And then we get to final three and I'm like, Drew, so have you thought about who you're going to take to the end? And it's the whole, ah, oh, man, there's so many options. And I was like, well, really? There's a lot of options. How wonderful. So Drew wins and he cuts me for third. And I'm livid because I really felt myself winning. And so we get to the jury question and I'm barely, I, I, I whenever I lose, I need like an hour and I have like 10 minutes because we were doing jury like right there. And my jury question to Drew was to the effect of like, I just want a yes or no answer. Did you cut me because you thought you had a better chance of beating JG? And he said, no. And he elaborated and said that like he had formed such a close connection with JG that like he really saw himself in the end with JG, which to me, I was like, oh, so you hate me? Because literally this cast was 80% season nine people and you could back seven later every single one of them. But when it comes to JG, oh, sorry, Jodalee, I just don't like you. And I was like, work. Well, I'm not going to vote for you, even though I feel like you played the better game. And he lost. So that was wonderful for me. And I went to Drew after and I was like, hey, I just want you to know, I completely forgive you for cutting me. You know, if I had wanted, I may have cut you as well. So, you know, it's, it's fair. 
And Drew was like, oh, that's awesome. Ha, 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 ha. And I realized that that apology was not for Drew, it was for me. And I did not feel satisfied. So I told myself the next time that I'm in a game with Drew, like, I feel like I had him clocked from like day one. And the fact that he got me was so frustrating because I tried to go for him. And so I told myself the next time I saw Drew, it was going to be on and it was going to be, I was going to get him. And so I round the corner and I see him sitting two spots down. First of all, that lineup with the people next to me, me, Wesley Bryant of Penthouse fame, hot girl Chris, who has been my number one friend on 10 Gage for years, and then the demon, Drew. I was like, this is a hot mess. But I was like in my head as he's giving his intro, like the Kill Bill sirens are going on in my head. And I'm like, okay, are we going to fresh slate because this is a live game? Or are we going to double down and say we're going for him? And I chose to double down. And now, now that given everything that happens in the season, I can now say I, I, I've given up the ghost, you know? I feel like I threw everything that I had at Drew and I tried to get as many people as I could to go after Drew. And ultimately it didn't work. He didn't go home at any point, but you know what? Neither did I. So you know what? Even if I have my goals, I can placate them. I don't have to secure the oxygen mask of anyone else other than myself. They tell you to put the oxygen mask on yourself before the children. I can't protect the children, but I can protect myself. And I'm very proud of that. And now we're great friends. We talk, we laugh, we high five. And perhaps in my delusion, I feel like Drew and I have a lot of similarities in the way that we play the game, which is why like, even if we're clashing, if one of us goes, the other is probably soon after. So now it's wonderful. The next time Drew and I play a game together, if any, because he doesn't play money, I'm sure it'll be. <laughs> are you um are you just saying that because the next time you 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 secretly want to cut him? I mean, it would be a moment very pleasing to me in my career to do that, but I am a very strong believer of you know going into any sort of game with like clean energy. You know, if you go in with any sort of preconceived judgment one way or another, that could really block you from the big picture, you know, whether that's someone's reputation in a game of like, they won everything, so I have to target them. Sometimes it's not a good idea, or this person gets pre-jury all the time, so I'm going to work with them. Sometimes that's not a good idea. So I do really try and go into every game and like clear my mind and be like, give everyone an equal slate. And I just didn't do that with Drew for once, you know? But no, really, next time we're going to be fine. And whatever happens then, happens then. <laughs> okay. I don't know if I believe that, but... Uh... <laughs> um, um, so you mentioned Hot Girl Chris, and I want to ask you specifically, um, when did the Black Girl Magic Alliance form? Um, I was talking to Taisha and Hot Girl Chris, and I don't really know if there was a concrete answer on when it formed, so I figured you probably had the best uh, memory in terms of that. Um, well, okay. I started working with HGC um, <laughs> very early. I, you know, I have received the feedback that may, I may have made more than one final two quite early on and you know HTC was one of them and I remember like in casino night there's a moment where he's like in the bedroom and there are no cameras and it's just me and I'm passing through and I was like we're the final two right and he's like yes we high fived and we kept him moving I knew I was good with HTC from there just because I, I felt it and it was during I want to say it was during the Melissa round because that round was Taisha and I did not really have a strong dialogue between us until the Melissa round. And I remember, cause with Taisha, I remember there were like a few people in my mind. I was like, don't bond with these people. Cause if you need to throw out a name early, just have like a short list. And she was on that short list cause she uh, came after a friend of mine in a game. And I was like, oh, I'm going to get her. And then the Melissa round, uh, she like came up to me and was like, you know, we can keep Melissa. You know, like we have the votes to do that. And I was like, but who would you go after? 
And she was like, oh, we go after Marvin, which was amazing for me because uh, the Laundry Room Alliance ate its own because Carson and Marvin can't keep a story straight. And so it was that round when Taisha and I started really connecting. Sorry if you can hear the car. And HGC like noticed it and came up and was just like, just so you know, we already lost Christopher, you know, like I would really like this to be an alliance that works. And at the time I remember being like, yes, oh my God. But in the back of my mind, I was like, I don't trust this. Just because HGC and Taisha have not received any votes, no one has ever dared write their names down. Meanwhile, I'm being targeted every round at this point. So I was like, I'll say yes to this, but uh, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. And then at the end of the second night, which would have been after Marvin's elimination and after Kennedy had won the um, bucket Water challenge. Fun. Yeah, I remember being very unhappy with the way that the last couple head rounds had gone. And I remember everyone was like downstairs watching like Heather Lee Cameron videos. And I remember being like, you know what? I'm just not having a good time. I'm gonna go. And I go upstairs and I have <laughs> my old Waffle House meal that I bought with Paul. Now And now Paul's dead. So now I'm like, oh my God, all my friends are going home. And then HGC comes up and is like, are you okay? And I'm like, Honestly, Chris, I'm not. I have no chance of winning. How wonderful. And then at some point, and then we start talking strategy more in depth than we had ever before. And we literally talk about targeting Taisha. And five minutes later, Taisha comes up and was like, am I the only one not enjoying what's going on down there? Like, I can't force myself to have fun when I'm not having fun. And I, we were like, you know what? That's real. <laughs> like, we can... I mean, even if the rest of the group wants to sit and watch some be bad at cooking, that doesn't necessarily mean we have to be. And it was at that point we all connected about how no matter, our three games up to that point had been vastly different from each other. Like the Venn diagram of who the three of us had been working with, like almost not overlap. But we just sat up there at that kitchen table and talked for what seemed to be a long time and we just connected and I think we all realized there that A, like we all like each other, B, this could be a legitimate three that people don't see coming and C, there's actually a, like none of us had been given an offer to go to the top three. Like we all had various like alliances and deals, but I don't think anyone really saw myself as I have to protect Jodely to go to the end. I have to protect HGC to go to the end. I have to protect Taisha, despite that Taisha's arguable. But I think we all felt like this could be like the three. And I think that was the moment that Black Girl Magic was like solidified. Up until that point, the three of us barely even went to eliminations together. But I think that night at the end of day two, before we start merging, our connection really started there, I would say. It's interesting because, um, yeah, it's interesting. That's an interesting point um, because that's pretty deep into the game and it seemed like um, it kind of was a pretty strong alliance and, it, you know, it, that's, if that's when it's formed, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, earlier you mentioned the Laundry room, room Alliance not being able to keep a secret. I feel like there's more that you wanted to say about that. <laughs> okay, well, I, the first day, like, okay, I remember, okay, in my watch party after Ryan's elimination, I remember, like, obviously, I did not want Ryan to go at all, and I felt awful that it was him, and I didn't even vote him, I voted against <laughs> the first alliance I was included in to try and keep him in. But I remember after that round being like, oh, this is easy. I'm so well liked by everybody. This is amazing. And part of the reason that was, was because I had the six person Maddie Alliance, which I felt very confident in. But I also had the laundry room alliance, which was me, Eric, Carson, and Marvin. And I remember the night before that we had all gathered together and talked about like, oh my gosh, like, don't you know that some of these people have played Ascendance together? 
And I was like, it clicked for me that like, oh, none of these three people have played Ascendants before. And I kind of know these people through their reputation through the org community, but none of these people really know me. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're right. Like Drew and Erica from season nine, isn't that crazy? And they're like, what? They played together? And I was like, yes. So let's get rid of Drew, which obviously didn't go anywhere. <laughs> but I felt wonderful about the four person alliance just because I felt like if it became alumni versus non-alumni, to be a part of an alliance that was completely non-alumni was wonderful for me. And I was really willing to go to bat for each of the three of those at the time. And then comes the round where Eric's name came up. All throughout the day, Eric had like that sixth sense feeling that it was going to be his name. And, you know, he was saying like, I'm more soft-spoken. It's harder for me to speak up in front of other people. And I was just like snapped back to like the first <laughs> games I played wrapped up in three shower curtains, two towels topped on each other, of eight half bouncing and trying to be like, hi guys, trust me. And I was like, you know what, Eric, you're not going home. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, I remember talking to the other team and Christopher specifically was like, you know, I don't really know if I want Eric to go. And I was like, who do you want to go? And he says like, you know, the one person on my team, I guess I haven't really connected with the most is Zoe. And I was like, you know what? That's a wonderful idea because Eric's going to be super loyal to whoever saves him. He doesn't have anyone. If we save him now, he's going to be with the people that go with him. So I go and I start throwing out Zoe's name. And soon enough, Zoe comes up to me and says, I know you're voting for me. And I'm like, no, but yeah, but no, <laughs> you know? And then at some point, Carson comes up and Carson's like, Zoe, oh my gosh, like I would feel awful if you went right now. There's no way we're gonna be voting for you. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, Carson, what are you doing? Like we made an alliance with Eric like six hours ago in the, in the laundry, it was called the Laundry Room Alliance. And then Carson's like, yeah, I think the votes are there for Eric to go home. I was like, I'm loyal to some disloyal players. How wonderful. And then, you know, when Eric is giving his final speech, they didn't catch it because they didn't have the footage of him talking. But like, Eric is here. He stands up and he turns around and he's talking to us. He's looking directly at us. And Marvin is like two seats down. And every time like Eric turns his back, Marvin like, mouths behind him and points at Eric and is like, vote him out, he's going home. And I remember being like, excuse me? We we were literally an alliance. Like, what is this behavior? And then on top of which, after me trying to fight to send Zoe home the whole time, Eric thinks it's my fault that he's going and I'm all of a sudden the biggest social threat of the sneakiest player. And Marvin and Carson are over there laughing like it's the funniest thing. And after that happened, I remember being like, oh, Carson and Marvin suck. <laughs> Love Carson. I, I literally, we, we were also a final two from the very beginning and I couldn't stay mad at Carson for more than 30 seconds. But I remember thinking these two just cannot be trusted and that's awful. Clearly post-season, I would like to think our group has remained close, but I guess something about being in the house, it just wasn't meant to be. And Eric was completely robbed, for sure. <laughs> Eric was robbed. Um, yes. That was an interesting moment where he kind of calls you out after his elimination. Um, <laughs> those, those are always tough when they try to paint a pic. Well, not try, but kind of paint a picture on you, you know, hit him leaving and then being like, kind of calling you a snake a little bit. I know, and I remember I have I had watched live games. I, lo I, love, I love watching live games. It's a fun thing to do. And I know people that have like amazing like strategy online. And then I see them go into a live game and it evaporates and they're just a nervous mess and it's a horrible thing. And I remember thinking like, I don't want that to happen to me. Like whatever happens, no matter how much of myself I get to show, I hope that like the strengths that I've accumulated online translate in person. And I remember, cause usually when I'm in an org because of my mass and the way that I look, I'm usually like a target round one and round one passes and no one says my name even though like my team is supposed to be ganged up on and I'm like, oh, this is completely different. And then here rolls around round two, me being called out for being too social. And I was like, never mind, this is exactly the same. <laughs> I don't think it was the biggest social threat at the time, but 
who knows? I made it to the end. Maybe he was right. <laughs> he probably was. Um, but Jodely, I, I picked up on something that I feel like you do a lot in this setting. And I feel like you you talk to people, right? And then you like kind of hold their hands and then <laughs> sometimes you lie to those people. <laughs> Oh, do I want to hold your hand? That doesn't sound like me. Um, so what's what's with that? Like, talk about okay. that. Well, I am not a touchy person, IRL. I'm very much the person who's like, don't touch me. Don't get in my space. But I like when I started playing online, I remember being like, okay, so because you look like a spooky serial killer, the best thing you can do is flip that into like, cutesy like oh what a cute thing to do so like online I think you can message anyone from my season of Ascendance of Heroes Awaken and all of them can tell you that I definitely like said in text can I take your hand and talk to you like can I look you in the eyes can we have our Oprah moment on the couch I'm pretty sure that like I think that's the thing that I was just like commonly type and then I remember going in person and being like <sighs> Melissa's here like people that have played games with me are here like if I don't do that they may look at that and be like oh so that was just like fake you don't actually want to take people's hands and if they do know me and I do actually physically take their hands perhaps there's a moment where they'll be like oh, Jodalee has done this so much and now it's finally meant to be we can't crush this moment so I was like taking everybody's hands and that's part of the reason why I brought gloves because I was like I don't want to touch these people but I have to take their hands and also like I discovered that like it's it's a lot harder for someone to like say something that they think will hurt your feelings if you're literally like connected to them. And so there are certain moments <laughs> where I would like ask to hold someone's hand and they would like hold it for a second and then drop it, Jake's Bards. And I'd be like, oh, <laughs> oh, this is where we are in the game. How wonderful. But I, I don't, I, did I just hold people's hands in the blatantly light of them? I hope not. Probably later in the game. My well, you did, you did say that you held like pretty much everybody's hands. So if you did tell a lie, I guess that's true. Maybe. Matthew Papa has said like, oh, like there, he's like taken like little screenshots of me holding people's hands around that they go home, which I don't think my hand holding is the kiss of death. I just, you know, it just makes But it could be. No, no, <laughs> I would... I mean, half the people I voted for didn't even go the round that they left. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's the black cat. But I, I, I truly just intended it to be like a nice little throwback moment uh, for the people in the game. And uh, I don't think people could like, it's hard to imagine someone holding your hand and uh, throwing you down a river at the same time. So sword that heals both ways, I would say. <laughs> yes. Um... I want to ask you about the moment where you are in a hallway with <laughs> Marvin and Wesley mm -hmm. and things get a little bit crazy. Uh, so what, what happened? Did you lie to somebody? Did you tell somebody about power and mm -hmm. kind of just run through that story? Okay. Well, let's, let's take it back to when we actually find Marvin having the power. So that was fun. That was another fun time. It was, yeah. Watching it back, I can appreciate that it's good TV. But like in the moment, like up until that point, I had not been really taking the game seriously. I think I was still so starstruck. Like I'm in Tennessee, I'm on camera, how wonderful. And like with Ryan going home, Ryan went home because he threw a couple people under the bus when he didn't have to. When Eric went home, Eric had kind of done the same thing, embroiling himself in that Kennedy drama, the Kennedy Keaton stuff, and that got him bit. So at that point, I was like, the person that has made the blatant mistake each time has just gone home. And I can deal with that because I won't be making blatant mistakes. And then I made a blatant mistake when I targeted Zoe and got like nothing for it. Not even the person I was protecting, like felt like I was protecting them. So when that round came around, especially because it was after that whole balloon gate thing where it was a whole saga in itself. I was confident that like, okay, the names are going to be HGC or Carson because like they're the ones that are most vocally like, hoorah, go green, you can't target our team. And I was like, go fight and do whatever you need to do. 
And then I start hearing my name popping up and it just, it just all emotionally hits me that round of like, oh my God, like this is supposed to be my big moment, my big step into the unknown as Elsa would say. And I'm about to go home third. And I was devastated. I think the edit was very gracious of my behavior that round because I was just like panically like going each to each group of people, stating my case, going on the campaign trail. And so when it came to that round, when it came to that conversation where it's Marvin, I remember thinking, I was like walking into that round being like, if there's a way I can get Carson or Marvin out for Eric, I'm going to. And all of a sudden, like they're some of the main forces that are gonna be deciding who stays and who goes. And I remember being devastated because I didn't think there was, a. I thought if they were gonna flip on Eric, they were for sure gonna flip on me. And so when I see Marvin get the power, I remember like, I remember my eyes widening and I was like, let him know, let him know that you saw it. And I, I make like a, like a noise, like I do like a click or something. And Marvin and I make eye contact. And I remember just being, I just gave him like a look over and I just nodded and he nodded back. And I was like, okay, because I wasn't going to tell anyone what I tell him that I say that Marvin finds an idol and then he plays it and then I go home for sure. You know, like I didn't feel like exposing it was going to do anything. But since I thought there was a good chance I could go home, I was like, okay, you have to tell someone. Like, you have to tell at least one person. If you go home right now, at least have some effect on the later form of the game. So I literally just turn and I grab someone's arm and I'm like, hey, just so you know, it could be me tonight. I get that. But Marvin just found something. Like, be ready in case that happens. I just want you to know. And they were like, oh my God, like, thank you for letting me know. I really appreciate that. I go and sit down and guess who that person I grabbed was? It was Kennedy. And at this point, I don't, I'm not privy to the fact that Kennedy and Marvin are feeling each other, that they're close. And so Kennedy obviously knew that Marvin took the advantage because he told her. And I think the fact that I like turned to her and I told her and only her, in my mind, it was like, okay, Kennedy and Marvin are going to know that I'm with them because I haven't told anybody else. And Christopher goes home and I go up to Marvin and I was like, hey, like, I really appreciate you saving me. I know you have an advantage. I'm not going to tell anybody. You don't even have to tell me what it is. And with, with the thought in my mind being, Marvin's totally going to tell me what it is. We're like a threesome now. And Marvin goes, thanks, and leaves. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay, maybe not. But after that, I'm like, I feel very gracious towards Kennedy and Marvin. And um, I feel wonderful about them. Cut to the Paul round where we, our team loses. And I'm thinking like, okay, it's probably Wesley's time to go. Live, I live for him. He's one of my favorite people, but he's probably going just because like on the one hand, Kennedy, Marvin, and Paul, like that's my roommate. And those two are, have voted to keep me. I know that about their advantage. They wouldn't want to scorn me and go for me. They're not going to vote me. And on the other hand, I've been kind of pulled in a little bit to an alliance with Thomas and Zoe and Taisha, West Coast Alliance, kind of. And they're not gonna go for me either. And then all of a sudden, like Thomas is like, hey, just so you know, Kennedy and Marvin are telling Paul that you have to go home. And I just remember being like, this does not compute at all. This makes no sense to me. And we all vote them and Paul goes home, which Paul robbed. And then we get to that round where it's me, it's Kennedy, it's Wesley, and it's Drew. And I remember like being super bummed we lost that challenge just because I really thought it was something we could win. And I remember sitting in that chair and being like, ah, and then running over the names in my head. And I was like, wait a second, wait a second. Wait a second. So Kennedy's, Ken, everyone wants Kennedy out. Wesley has been at every elimination. I've been getting votes left and right. And Erica has been dying to like rebuild the relationship with me after she voted for me when Christopher left and we haven't had a chance to do it. And who does that leave? That leaves Drew. So in my mind, I'm like, oh, this is so good. We're going to vote for Drew. It's going to be wonderful. And I remember going to Wesley and to Kennedy and being like, 
we have to take out Drew, like now, like this is the only chance we're gonna have to do it. And Wesley's on board, he's wonderful. He says, lamb and we'll do it, which is wonderful to hear. And then Kennedy is like, I can't do it. Like Drew is the one person in this team I can't vote. And I was like, uh, that's, I'm not gonna accept that as an answer. So I'm running through the house, trying to pull Kennedy into every room and be like, what's going on? Like, you have to do Drew. And all of a sudden I see Kennedy, Marvin and Wesley having a conversation and Marvin's voice picks up right as I see him. So I'm like, oh, let me go ahead and walk over. You know, let me sprinkle some magic love and maybe we can work together as four. And Marvin starts talking about like, oh, you all told about the advantage because you were the only people I told, which in the back of my mind, I was like, you're close to Wesley. Okay, weird, but wonderful. And Wesley says, I, I didn't tell, I didn't tell a single person about your advantage. And then he, Marvin like whirls around to me and is like, so you did. And I was like, I have, and he cuts me off. He says, no, you're done. You're a liar. You've done it. And he goes and he runs off and he has a whole moment. And I just remember being so confused. Cause I was like, Marvin's not even going to this elimination number one. So I don't understand why, it's, why he's here. And number two, like I genuinely, genuinely, genuinely never told anyone about Marvin's advantage except Kennedy. I did not tell a single person. Postseason, we've been able to discover that it was Thomas who just surmised that figured out that Marvin had something because he was putting himself in conversations. So no one actually, to my knowledge, told anyone that Marvin had an advantage. Thomas figured it out. But Marvin believed that the best judgment was that I was the betrayer and I had told everybody and I was against them from the beginning. And so that's where that drama had come from. I, I was very lost and confused. And I was like, do I still try and get Kennedy on my side, even though her number one ally is telling her that I'm the traitor of the season? Do I still go for Drew? Like I felt very lost and I felt like I had to cover my base at that point. Then I had my conversation with Drew of like, oh my God, this is going to be so random. I may or may not have been like throwing your name up there, but it was like a joke. It's fine. And Drew was like, oh, it's okay. I trust you totally. And I was like, oh, you're so wonderful. And then Kennedy pulls out that idol. And I, Wesley has like said that like she looked to him and said like, it's me. But I'm sitting right next to Wesley. I could have sworn she made eye contact with me. And when she did, I was like, because it would just, it just all made sense. Like Marvin putting himself in the conversation, Kennedy not receiving my plan, her not like talking to me. And I was like, oh, I'm about to be idled up by Kennedy. This is a disaster. And then Wesley gets eliminated. And again, they're very gracious towards me because like I almost like start like bawling on the chair and I'm like, oh my God, this is so horrible because I really liked Wesley and I thought it, it was a whole emotional mess. But to keep it concise as much as we can now, <laughs> the drama that, came from Marvin accusing me. Um, that was the first time that I thought you were going because I thought, I thought that, um, I thought Kennedy was going to put her vote onto you yeah. because there was a scene where it's like Marvin telling her to do so. Um, but come to find out she votes out Wesley there. Was there ever a thought in your mind to throw a vote? <laughs> Just at that elimination or across the season? Because it would have helped him at that specific at, at that specific <laughs> elimination where all the votes were on Kennedy. It no, it didn't cross my mind because the thing was like it didn't make sense for me to throw a vote if Kennedy was still leaving. Like I was definitely trying to go for Drew. And I felt like if I had voted Drew, even though I knew that no one else was doing it, it would have been blatantly obvious who that vote was, whether or not Kennedy stayed or left. And voting Wesley, like at that point, Wesley was like my emotional support seat buddy. Whenever I wanted to go sit down and I was nervous, I like actively sought out sitting next to Wesley because I was like, oh my God, you're so big and soft, like just stay here. And the other person that was vulnerable was Kennedy. And so I was like, Wesley and I have established this really good relationship. I don't want Drew to realize that I am like actively hunting him and have been from the beginning yet. We have to keep hiding that. So like, if I wasn't gonna be in majority against either of those two, I felt like it just made the most sense to just 
mission failed, you'll try again. But in hindsight, if I had, yeah, I, I think I think it turned out right. And I don't, th I have received some feedback in the alumni chat that says that some people believe that Kennedy's best move was getting rid of me. I personally don't think that was the case. And I'm just very grateful to Kennedy that she did not take me out. I would have been horrified. Uh, I've done a lot of things in the sentence. I don't know, has never been one of them, so. Thank God. Knock on wood, yeah, knock on wood right. there. Um, <laughs> so the other time that I thought you were going to get pendented out was when Taisha left. Mm -hmm. I was super shocked that it was not you at that point. Um, but Drew does explain his reasoning why he ended up voting out Taisha. What did you, did you think you were going there? Honestly, I didn't. I felt did. like I, I did not. Okay. I, felt, I felt secure when Drew put out the idol. Obviously, it's still like a gut-wrenching feeling when the, you know, the whole, oh my God, everyone hug me, I'm crying. It felt, I remember feeling like I was on Nickelodeon and I just got slimed. I was like, this is gross. And this is what has just transpired. But like the past couple of, like when Thomas had left, I told Drew point blank, like Thomas is probably who I'm going to be voting. And Drew kind of went back into, you know, I mean, if that's where the votes are going, yeah, you have to do what you have to do. And I was like, in the back of my mind, he doesn't think it's going to happen. Like, he thinks I'm going to fall off on my face. And then I didn't. And like the pre, the next round, when Zoe was in hot water, Drew had come up to me and was like, you, me, Zoe, Kennedy, HGC, why don't we just make that the five and we chop the other two? And I feel like I had played ball and showed enough interest in that where Drew was like, okay, if we need to flip a number to work with me, Kennedy and Zoe out of everyone left in the game, it's going to be Jodely. I, I felt like it was, it, I thought they would think it's either Erica or Jodely. And so when we had got to that point at the final five, I remember I didn't directly tell Drew I was voting him out until very late into the round. But I eventually did. And I had toyed with the idea of voting out Erica there just because I, you know, Erica and Taisha, I did read them to be very close. That was how I viewed them. And Drew was right in his assessment of like, they could just chop you if they get to the end. And I was like, you know what? Maybe it's time to play with the dog. And then I put, oh my God, no, I, Drew was not a dog, but like, maybe it's time to play a ball. Amen. And I'm a huge Drew Olsen fan. I really, really am. Just not in games. But long story short, I felt like I had shown enough genuine interest in Drew's plan. Whereas like Taisha at that point after flipping on Thomas, I felt she was just like, no, this is my people and I'm not shaking. And I felt like I had shown a little bit of shoulder, a little bit of, okay, there's a little bit of, you know, allure there. Perhaps you never know. And I think that, kind of tilted in my favor. Clearly, it was more so the fact that Drew feared the relationship Erica and Taisha had versus whatever strategicness I thought I was doing. But in my mind, when he pulled out the idol, I was like, okay, I haven't won any individual challenges. You know, I've kind of been just scrapping on through the whole season. Idling me out would seem a little bit like a waste compared to Taisha, who has just been socially dominant the whole time so I think he's gonna pick Taisha and he did but it didn't make it feel any better but I was like oh survived two pendants thank goodness <laughs> yeah um another time that I was blindsided <laughs> with your decision making was at the final four the yeah. very next round I was like wow Jodely is just gonna vote out Akko Chris here I was like this seems really weird but it just seemed like the way the episode was going and then you send it to you send it to a face-off so what was like I guess why not just play it like um like tell them exactly what you were doing as opposed to kind of like leading them on the other way <laughs> okay so here's the thing 
Drew had said like rounds before that, like consecutively, like I'm taking Erica, like Erica's my gal, I'm gonna take Erica. And I was like, that's fine, you're in minority. That's wonderful. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he wasn't in minority and all of a sudden he has immunity at final four and it's a terrible debacle. And he sits me down and he says, Jodely, you know, Erica and I kind of have the power. You know, you can either go with us or you're going to a duel. And I was like, ooh. Ooh, how disrespectful. Not this person I've had on the ropes for rounds now being like the decision maker. How gross. <laughs> and so in my mind, I was like, if these people are smart, I would think that the person you sent to fire against Erica is the person who has won no challenges. And I was like, that's me. And honestly, if I was in that final four, I felt like that would have been the end of my game because I hadn't been successful at any challenges before. So I was like, okay whatever you can do to get the boat off of you, even if it goes to fire, HGC has won multiple a challenge. Like it's much more likely that HGC can defeat Erica than it is for you to defeat Erica. And I would have just straight up told them, except for the fact that I felt like if they knew that I wasn't with them, they would have had enough time to recollect and change their votes to be on me. And I felt like the odds were a lot better for HGC to be Erica and Fire. The tough part was I was dying to tell HGC the whole time, like, there's no way I'm voting for you. Because I also felt like, like, I had told Erica, <laughs> oh my God, I also told Erica I wanted to take her to the final two, didn't I? <laughs> Sorry, we're kind of racking them up in the season. <laughs> but I had told Erica I wanted to take her to finals. But then I, like, looked at it objectively. And I was like, if... HGC and Drew are both in the final three with you. Like, there's actually a strong chance that they cut each other. And honestly, it would have been kind of funny if Drew was like, I take Joe to leave the final two. That would have been hilarious. And also, like, I felt very confident that HGC was going to cut Drew. I had no doubts there. So I was like, grimy as it is, it kind of makes the most sense for Erica to go here. And I would have told HGC, but like, as we're having our one-on-one, -on -one, cause we all like cycle at that point and have our one-on-ones, Drew is like slithering behind my back and I can like hear him. And so HTC straight up asks when he's like behind me, like, are you sending me home? And I remember being like, oh, yes, I'm gonna vote you out. You're done. And like HTC starts crying. And I was like, this is, I feel horrible for so many reasons. And then we get to that vote where everyone's like, HGC, we love you. Let's all hold hands. It's going to be such an easy vote. And then that last vote comes up for HGC. And like Drew and Erica both swirl around and glare at me. And I'm just like, I'm so sorry. It was, it was awful having to lie that consistent. I felt like I was playing the mole versus playing Ascendance or Survivor. It felt, it felt unfortunate. But I thought it was the best game move. Sorry to the three of y'all. I didn't mean to give you a heart attack. <laughs> it made for great TV. Um, and, you know, your explanation is great. I think that's brilliant, honestly. Um, oh. Makes a lot of sense. But I want to run through some of these final three scenarios after HGC loses the face-off. Okay. Um, you are in the... You were in the driver's seat. You were going up against Drew Olsen in part three. Oh, which and you, you ultimately lost. But <laughs> if you had won, you're cutting Drew, right? Yeah. <laughs> 100%. 100%. I, I, I remember, I just remember thinking like, okay, like, because... I try not to think about the end game until like the end because when you get your eyes on the prize from super early you, I feel like you lose the details around you in the moment so it wasn't like I never like after day one I was like oh you're totally not making it to the end and after day two right after Marvin goes home and Wesley's gone I was like oh you're totally not making it to the end and it wasn't until that moment where like HGC wins immunity at top six and the four of us don't even need to talk. We're just like, it's, we're going to do Drew or Kennedy. But I was like, oh my God, well, wait a second. We have something here. And so I remember thinking like the only thing that I don't have to complete a full baked cake to the jury is a competition win. 
And like, I had been given immunity. I had been given advantages. I had just never been given, I had never won immunity for myself. And so um, I remember thinking like with my one comp win, I have to make it count. And every single person on this jury knows that I had told all of them that Drew Olsen is the demon. So if I used my one comp win to cut him, I, I was ready to argue at the end, like, okay, maybe it took me some time, but when I said I was going to do something in the game, come Hades or high water, I would deliver on it. And I was ready to deliver in 30 minutes or less. Otherwise the pizza would have been free and that would have been a disaster for sales. So I 100% would have cut through, although I would have, I would have toyed with it. I would have had a whole, I, I, I was going to have shocked faces and everything. I feel, who knows. <laughs> so you cut Drew in this scenario you cut Drew and you were in a final two with Erica um, fourth placers that voted themselves out <laughs> um, who's who's winning that do you think I think oh, it's honestly tough I think that both of us have votes that we're for sure not getting I feel like Kennedy and Erica had butted heads so much in the season that Kennedy was never voting for Erica. On the flip side, Marvin was probably never voting for me, you know? I think, you know, the two of us, if we had sat in the end against each other, like, I knew of the core four, like, kind of since the Keaton elimination, just because, long story short, I did ask Thomas to make a West Coast alliance because I had originally wanted to target him, but then I realized he wasn't going home over Keaton, even though four out of the people from the Maddie lines were on the same team, but all of a sudden we couldn't get the votes to save Keaton. So I was like, oh my God, Thomas, you are wonderful. Oh my, Thomas. And I was like, do you want to like make an alliance? We're both from the West, so why don't we make this alliance and you can tell I'm serious about working with you. And he's like, eh, it's a little too early. I don't know, you know? And I was like, that's wonderful. I just want you to know that I'm like thinking of us and I want us to meet. And then the Paul round rolls around and Thomas is like, listen here, um, you are getting votes, but you have the votes to stay. There's a group and it's going to be me, you, Zoe, Drew, and we have Erica and we have Taisha. And I was like, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. I take five steps and I run smack into the fact of like, Arizona, Oregon, Oregon, California. And I'm like, oh my God, these witches were working together without me and with Taisha. This is horrible. This is so terrible. And sorry, relating it back to the fact, Erica and I were on the outs of that core four. Like we were the expendable numbers. And sitting at the end with her, I can imagine that those four would have looked at it and been like, you kind of piggybacked off off of us like you weren't like controlling this alliance and I don't necessarily know which way between us that that alliance who would have been fully in the jury would have voted especially because Erica was like everyone adored Erica but they weren't necessarily sure of like what were your moves versus me where like people did like me but they were like you were kind of a slime ball weren't you so like I don't know which way it would have gone I think it would have went to the speeches you know that's how we think yeah it would have been interesting I think it would have been I think your perception of of how that would have shaken out would have been fun to watch um I want to talk go ahead I was just gonna say, imagine giving a final tribal and like that mask and the lemon get up. Ooh, that would have been so much fun. I would have had, oh my gosh, the people who had no idea who I was were probably like, what is he wearing? <laughs> would have been fun. Would have been fun, but it didn't happen. So um, I want to talk about you going into, going into the speeches for finale. Were you looking for a reason not to vote for Drew? Um, a little bit. I well, I well. Here's the thing. Like, even as I was giving my goodbye speech and walking towards Stephanie and Erica, in my mind, it didn't feel like the game was over. Like, I just had my sights so set on like the end from like when I had bought my ticket that I was like, this doesn't 
feel like the end. And I, I, I wasn't really able to shake the feeling of like, but you're still in, you know? So going into the jury, like I still felt the same adrenaline as if I was playing that honestly, I didn't like really necessarily feel like, okay, it's time to vote for someone else to win until like halfway through the jury speeches. And here's the thing. I voted against Drew in Ghost of the Past and he lost. And that was largely in part to the fact that I felt super scorned by the way that he eliminated me after the relationship we had the whole season. However, this season, I got it. We, we, you know, we were not in a tight three-person alliance the whole game. We were not huddling together in the corner, in the shelter. Like we were, we just weren't that. And I didn't expect him to take me to the end. So going into it, I was like, I can't necessarily be mad at that. Drew was like the one person I didn't make a final two with. So hey, I should have should have went for the completion of 100% rate, but I did it. So I can't be mad at it. I I walked into it feeling like, you know, I, I did think Erica played the stronger game. However, to me, that was just one fact amongst many because I don't necessarily want to vote just for the person who played the best strategic game because that's so lame to just be like oh who is the best strategist vote that person that's so weird so I went I honestly feel like I went into it pretty even I would like to say I wasn't sealed against anything was there a point where you got won over to vote for Drew or was there it was it just a culmination of everything (sighs) honestly A lot of Drew's answers left me feeling unsatisfied. And I especially when there is that question of like, go down the line and say why you played a better game. Granted, I have not watched the finale. I've not watched the jury questionings just because why would I? But this is just all from my head. So maybe it came out a little differently on camera. But when Drew was going down the line and saying why he played a better game than every single person on the jury minus his two closest allies, and he gives all these detailed speeches and he gets to Jodely and he's like, okay, and I played a better game than Jodely because uh, you lied a lot. Um, Everyone else, I'm so, and I remember I was wearing my mask and I'm so lucky I was, my jaw dropped. And I was like, that's the perfect reason to not vote for Drew right there. Oh, I'm a liar. Well, I guess I'm not worthy to cast my vote for you. But I remember like closing speeches, all the answers given, whatever, whatever, I was like, okay, if one of these people have to beat me and upstage my dramatic reveal and be the winner, I would like it to be someone who just like bleeds, play the game before the game plays you as much as I felt like I would have. And even neither of them gave like a perfect final tribal, but I felt like what I felt more from Drew was like passion of like, I would like do anything to win this. And I felt like I had a lot of that myself and I resonated with that. So I was like, okay, you went through a lot, you know? And not to say that Erica didn't, but I was like, I feel like Drew's like fully evolved into gym leader Drew. So I, I, I can, if I were, if Drew were to win, I would feel comfortable that Drew would represent the story well. And then I was like, in my voting confessional, in the final voting confessional, I was like, okay, I'm voting for Drew, but just like, don't show my vote. Just like, it's okay. He doesn't need to know. And then it's the vote that gives him the win. Of course, of course, because why wouldn't it be? But yeah, I wouldn't say it was just one, it was one particular answer that won me over. It was just looking over the game as a whole and the jury questioning as a whole. And I was like, who's going to represent the strongest and I felt like Drew could in the moment. So yeah, that was a great answer, Jolie. Um my last well before I ask my last question, I want to give you the opportunity to tell me if there's anything that we haven't covered regarding your game and ascendance that you want to talk about. Um sure. Yes, I do. Um, what are some things? Uh, I tried to make an outsider's alliance with a large group of people and it ate itself immediately. <laughs> the round that the the round of the double, I remember I I went to a couple people and I was like, listen, 
the same people are getting votes over and over at tribal and some people have like yet to be not immune and those people are going to get targeted as soon as they lose immunity so why don't we just make a group of me wesley jake kennedy marvin um and just like maybe like paul for extra numbers carson carson had a lot of votes why don't we just make that a group and I remember like Jake was like, yeah, let's do it. And Wesley was like, yeah, I love that. And Carson was like, yeah, let's go. And Melissa comes up to me and she's like, hey, tonight it's going to either be Kennedy or Wesley. And I was like, oh, wonderful. We can, you know, if Kennedy goes, Kennedy goes. And that, you know, that's someone that knows about that advantage out of the way. And then sitting on the other side of the couch and seeing the argument form between Carson, Wesley, and Jake, like three people who I wanted to work with, it shattered my heart into a million pieces. And I was like, okay, the minority can't work together because we're losers. <laughs> and then also they did not show it and I feel very robbed of it, but um, I had an exceptionally close relationship with Carson throughout the whole season. He and I bonded from the very beginning. We just hit it off. And you want to talk about me touching people? I like, I would love when Carson would like just cut clear across the room, like pass groups of people and just come up to me and be like, Jodely, like take my arm. Do you want to go talk in the closet? Like past like 10 people who just saw us. I lived for Carson. He was wonderful. They didn't show it because I guess we weren't that successful of a final two, but he was wonderful. And for the record, Carson gave me his advantage before he was eliminated. There is a moment in Carson's elimination where they like, Drew Carson just pulled Jodely into the closet. What are they talking about? And it was Carson giving me his advantage. And I had that ripped up benched power in the bottom of my shoe for the rest of the game. And I was, I was like, there's never, like, I only wanted to play it because that's a very aggressive power to like tell two people you're not competing in a challenge. So I was like, if I play this, I want to make sure it's in a challenge that I know I can win. And <laughs> I never felt like that challenge came around for me. So I just never ended up using it. And I was content with like, being the Marianne before Marianne, if I had made final two and being like, what you don't know is I have the merge advantage. Here's the paper, here's the note and taking off my shoe and just flinging it around at everybody. That would have been so fun. But yeah, I had Carson's power and Carson is amazing. Chirp, chirp, choo, choo. Hello. Like All aboard the car car hype train. Yes. Oh my gosh. I was such a huge fan. He's from the ball state. I'm Joda Lee with two L's. Ball with two L's. Like we just, it, we just instantly clicked. I'm a huge Carson fan. So know that. <laughs> we all are we all are very big Carson fans on this podcast. We all are aboard the car car hype train. So shout okay. out to Carson. Absolutely. All right, Jodely. This is my last question for you. Um, and it is what was your favorite part of the entire experience? <sighs> oh boy. Could be anything. Yes. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think, I think my favorite part of the experience was not necessarily like the game, like a game move per se. I just remember when there would be moments just like in between, like waiting for competitions or like during deliberation where I just catch a moment to myself when I'm sitting on the chair and I'm just like, you are literally in a different country, in a wild place called Tennessee, like surrounded by lions that you have looked up to and adored. And some of these people that you never thought you would ever get the chance to compete against online, let alone like be in person fighting amongst. And you're doing it. Like you are in the game. You are, it's, it's always been a dream of mine to be able to, take my levels of whimsy and wackiness and apply it to a game, especially because I know a lot of people don't see me describing my own gameplay often takes wild turns and people are like, oh, okay, he's kind of crazy. It's not going to work. But, you know, I have belief in myself and the fact that like, I was like, like every, like all the games that I played before this, it felt like it led up to me being 
in a live game format and like living out my dream. And so I would say my favorite moment was just those like little, you know, quirky moments where you could just sit and be like, you're doing it. You know, you did just get into a fight with a veteran. You did, you know, you did just tell <laughs> Taisha Tice that you're going to target her in night one and she laughed at it, you know? You did just, you know, <laughs> betray Drew Olsen for the eighth time and he still hasn't figured it out. <laughs> it was wonderful. So I would say my favorite moment was just knowing that like, I'm living in the midst of my dream and now I'm unmasked. How terrible. I don't know how I'm ever going to get all this footage deleted. This is going to be a disaster. <laughs> well, Jodalee, thank you so much for coming on the Lost at Sea podcast. It was a pleasure watching you play this season and almost make it to those finale chairs and plea your, plea your case. Gosh, I am honestly, I hope that the first time I make it to final tribal after <laughs> years of build up of final juror I hope I just do awful that would be kind of funny I hope I just like I'll just say like vote for me and then just walk out that's what I'm gonna do you guys are not ready for when I make it to a final one of these days <laughs> let your game talk for itself you know what exactly just put the mask on and fall asleep no one will know <laughs> it'll be wonderful <laughs> well I look forward to that moment but until then um yeah i just appreciate you coming on the podcast man thank you for having me it's been wonderful it's the duke harley i've lost to see what a world <laughs>